Drama alert. As there so often is in the world of medicine today, there has been a real Twitter storm um, brewing, or bin fire, as is my preferred term for these events. This time it has involved a very large number of doctors, a group of healthcare professionals known as ACPs, and even a royal college, so strap in. I didn't think this would become an internet drama channel, but here we are. This all started four or five days ago when there was an anonymous post on Reddit, which is a social media platform, for those of you that aren't familiar, and this post indicated that an A&E department somewhere in the UK, an unnamed trust, was using an ACP as their EPIC or emergency physician in charge overnight, the most senior clinician in charge of running the ED. And for obvious reasons, this should always be a consultant in emergency medicine. So the first thing that we need to understand to pick this all apart is what an ACP is. ACP as a term stands for advanced clinical practice. Obviously this is extended when you're referring to an individual as an advanced clinical practitioner. The simplest way to conceptualize what an ACP is, is a non-medical allied health professional. So something like a paramedic, a nurse, a physiotherapist, a pharmacist, who has then undertaken additional training on top of their normal clinical role in order to manage more complex needs and see and treat patients with a greater degree of autonomy. It usually, but not always, requires five years of clinical practice in their domain of expertise and then some degree of master's level study on top of that. In practice these ACPs can then go on to see, diagnose, treat patients in a range of settings but we're going to be talking about A&E for the purposes of this video. So what is the central issue at play here? Well as I've said before, for obvious reasons, in any given ward or department within a hospital, the person in charge clinically, the most senior person with the greatest level of responsibility, is always a medical or surgical consultant. A very senior doctor who by virtue of finishing training is recognized as an expert in their subject area among their peers. The reason this is important is that all consultants have to reach a known standard, including many years of consistent and structured training all the way up to the point of becoming a consultant and beyond, several high stakes exams including membership and fellowship of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, and ongoing clinical portfolio development including training in leadership, education, and so on. Now to place all of this into context, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine sets their own guidelines on what is appropriate in terms of practice and autonomy for each type of health professional that might work in A&E according to their level of training. And this is split into five tiers which I will show on screen for you now. But according to the RCEM's guidelines, ACPs top out in their practice most of the time at tier three, with senior doctors and ultimately consultants occupying tiers four and five. There is also actually an equivalency stated between ACPs with RCEM credentialing and ST3 doctors at the tier three level, which is an interesting comparison that we won't dwell on for now and we'll come back to another time. So coming back to the original post, a trust choosing to utilize an ACP as their emergency physician in charge overnight clearly flies in the face of the Royal College guidelines. Understandably, there was shock and anger about this with lots of doctors taking to the internet to raise awareness and vent. Now, somewhat surprisingly for a Royal College, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine actually responded to this, indicating among other things that they stand with their ACPs, that they are the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, not the Royal College of Emergency Physicians, as well as reiterating their stance that ACPs should not be practicing above tier three although they see scope for progressive entrustment in the future. Now, as you might imagine, this really lit the candle because this would actually mean allowing an ACP to practice beyond the stated equivalence of an ST3 doctor in emergency medicine, up to tier four and potentially even tier five, because obviously if we're at tier three now and there is progressive entrustment going to happen, the only places that they can go is tiers four and five. And indeed, we have some degree of evidence from high up within the college that this is the plan. Uh, for those of us that are credentialed, we are working towards consultant level. Within the ACP forum, we are cre creating a post-credentialing curriculum, uh, which means that we can continue to establish our standards and work towards that consultant level. 
for those of us that for those that are on that's afraid that we're going to take away your consultant roles it's not going to happen don't panic okay all the exams you're doing will be there for you there is consultant jobs out there you will never have the situation where you have an acp stealing your consultant money okay um but what we will be doing is working in par with you. There is absolutely no reason why you can't have an ACP consultant standing there beside you as an emergency medicine consultant to support you. Now you can think what you like about this, but there are two groups of responses that have really irked me personally about this when going through Reddit and Twitter and reading all of the different responses. The first is this idea of the, the different view, which is often touted as one of the reasons why ACPs are so highly valued in these situations. That is to say that they bring a perspective or skills that your core medical staff, as in your doctors and your doctors in training, do not. However, this definition is so nebulous and vague that personally I think it's actively unhelpful when we're trying to have these discussions about stated equivalents. It's one of these things that seems kind of implicitly instinctively true, that of course because ACPs have a huge range of professional experiences and backgrounds that they will bring their own perspectives and skills to the table, of course they will. But firstly, ultimately what we're talking about here is the practice of medicine within the emergency department, seeing, diagnosing and treating patients. I'm not sure how those differences in perspective and skills that are gained in an environment environment outside the emergency department where these skills are being brought to bear are supposed to manifest themselves in a way that benefits patients. And to close that thought off, we don't apply the same logic when we're talking about doctors in training. For ACPs, it seems very much the case that their extra perspective, skills and development are considered as part of their training and development and highlighted as what makes them valuable but we don't do the same with junior doctors who have gone through a longer and more strenuous training pathway who may also bring a huge number of skills and perspectives from taking time out of training or additional degrees or qualifications that they already had before they went to medical school even somebody who was maybe a paramedic and then went to medical school wouldn't have that extra experience considered in their medical post so despite the fact that the college is trying to draw equivalences between these two groups it's somewhat telling that they don't do that for their doctors, but they do for other groups. And the second thing to say is that I genuinely don't think that anyone is questioning the ability or the value of ACPs in these settings. There was nothing denigrating said about utilizing ACPs. I'm sure they're massively valuable assets to the departments in which they work. The reality is that we don't have enough people on shop floor to deal with the workload, and if you can bring in suitably qualified and trained people, that will continue to keep patients safe, then great, you don't really have another choice. The overarching question that we have to ask is what standard do we set? What standard is safe for patients? What expectations do we set for the people that are gonna be working in these roles? And again, why do we set the standards and the expectations higher for doctors at equivalent levels than we do for non-doctors? That is to say, why do doctors in training work 48 hours a week, rotate every four months, have massively reduced job stability when they're trying to get into training, have to take high stakes exams and so on and so on in their own time that other roles simply don't have to do to achieve the same competency as defined by the Royal College? And as a doctor in training, myself, I don't really begrudge this extra workload and all of this stuff as it stands, because if that is the standard that is deemed to be required to keep patients safe, then I 100% agree that we don't dilute the standard, we make sure that every trainee is meeting that standard. But why is that standard higher for doctors if you're going to give other groups equivalency with doctors? That's the question. Now the second upset and the follow-up to this first problem has come this week when an NHS trust in Blackpool has advertised a post a non-medical consultant role for an ACP which will ultimately involve work on the tier 5 medical rota alongside emergency medicine consultants. So not only does this once again fly in the face of the Royal College's own guidelines, but the really amusing aspect to this was that when the first problem was raised last week, the number of consultants and senior doctors that turned on their junior colleagues, calling them elitist and reactionary and vilifying them, it has been very amusing to watch the tone change when it is now those consultants' jobs that are being deemed equivalent to non-medical roles. Well, well, well. 
how the turntables and we need to be very clear and careful about the semantics here, but this isn't the same as a role as something like a nurse consultant, which is its own defined thing. This is a consultant ACP role on the tier five rotor alongside ED fully trained medical consultants. And quite how that with things as they are, is supposed to be safe or responsible, I don't really understand. Because if something happens overnight and there's a question about negligence or someone being out of their depth and it goes to court, who is gonna be held responsible? Is that ACP in that consultant role going to be held to the same standard as a consultant physician? I don't know how that could possibly happen. So who bears ultimate responsibility? Are the other ED consultants on the rotor responsible for the ACP in this role? I don't know. I also don't know which consultant in their right mind would agree to accepting liability for someone else at that level. And if we look to other areas of medicine, consider something like trauma surgery, for example, or interventional cardiology, it would not even be up for discussion that someone that wasn't fully trained and credentialed would be operating or doing procedures in that setting. Why has this happened in emergency medicine in particular? I suspect it's probably just due to the sheer workload and volume of patients that need to be seen that has allowed this problem to develop. And I think that Dr. Emma Runswick has done the best summary of this. Emma is one of the new uh, electees, if you like, to BMA Council alongside myself. She ran as part of the broad left movement. She has done by far the best summary of the issues at play here, and I'll leave the link to the conversation she's had in the description below. But the really central issue, and I want you all to remember this and reflect on it, is that if the Royal College is allowing equivalency to be claimed, even to ST3 level with doctors, ignoring anything above that up to consultant, then there is a tacit agreement from them that the worst parts of medical training are not actually necessary to reach the standard that is deemed safe for patients. Expensive exams, constantly relocating, having to be the best of the best of the best at all times. Struggling to get training numbers, constant studying, research, audits. If equivalency is there to be claimed, then none of these things are actually necessary. And there's no justification for EM trainees to keep doing them. But obviously, don't expect that to change anytime soon. And the very last question to think about is how do you actually staff an ED? The reality among all of this is that there are way more patients to be seen than we have emergency medicine doctors. That comes back to Health Education England and the government who seemingly have no interest in, in, in increasing the number of emergency medicine training numbers that there are. And that's probably because the Department of Health doesn't give HEE the budget to do so. So if you were running a trust and in charge of running an emergency medicine service, what would you do? Would you become increasingly reliant on ACPs to staff shop floor, remembering that that takes away from your forces of nurses, physios, paramedics that you already have? Or would you simply refuse to run a service at all? without medical staffing on the grounds of it being unsafe. And the last thing to say is that and the last thing to say is that I hope the other royal colleges have been watching because this is what happens when you don't listen to your trainees and you vilify them from the top down. It is a bold move to alienate the overwhelming majority of your royal college membership, the people that pay the vast majority of your fees. So to borrow a quote from one of my favorite movies of all time, Dodgeball, a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Take care, and I'll see you next time.